The Arabs raided sub-Saharan Africa for 13 centuries without interruption. Most of the millions of men they deported have disappeared as a result of inhuman treatment. This painful page in the history of black people has apparently not been completely turned. This is a loosely translated quote from The Veiled Genocide, a book by Tidiane Ndiaye, a Senegalese author and anthropologist. So, when, how, and why did the Arab slavery of Africans occur? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you have not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. Of course, share our videos with all your contacts. So exactly when did Arab slavery start? Unlike the transatlantic uh, slave trade that featured the Americas and European merchants, the trans-Saharan slave trade is often ignored. Some scholars have even tried to claim that it was benign or harmless to Africa. However, the Arab Muslim slave trade, also known as the trans-Saharan uh, trade or eastern slave trade, lasted longer than the transatlantic slave trade. It operated for more than 1,300 years, taking millions of Africans away from the continent to work in foreign lands under the most inhumane conditions. Unfortunately, because it has not been as closely studied as the transatlantic slave trade, the exact number of people captured from Africa in the trans-Saharan slave trade is yet to be, asset, to, be, to be fully ascertained. It is currently estimated at about 9 million, 9 million souls. While the earliest documentation of um, Arab trafficking in black slaves from East Africa dates back to the early 2nd century, it was Arab Muslim conquest, which began in the 7th century, that boosted the Arab slave trade. We need to start by trying to understand the ascendance of the Arabs in world history. Arabs first became prominent in world history with the emergence of the Prophet Muhammad as the spiritual organizer of the Arab community. By founding the religion, Muhammad forged various groups of Arabs into one people. Between 622 and 750 AD, when Islam became the sole religion of the Arabs and the Caliphate, was still uh, predominantly only in control of the newly um, forged Arab kingdom, the name Arab then came to refer to those who were full members of an Arab community, either by being born in such a community or because they had ancestors who originated in the area under Arab control, which was then known as Arabia. Arabia did not initially include Persia, uh, Syria, uh, and uh, uh, Copts, and others who were only later brought under Arab rule through Islamic conquests. According to one of the foremost African historians, Dr. John Henry Clark, Yemen, which had been conquered by Abyssinia, uh, you will recall uh, from our previous episode on Ethiopia, that uh, Abyssinia is a historical name for it. Please make time to watch our episodes on Ethiopia if you haven't done so. So Yemen remained an Abyssinian colony until 574 um, CE, 
But by the seventh century, the Arabs invaded and conquered Egypt and subsequently other parts of Africa. Following such um, conquests, enterprising Arab merchants and middlemen started gathering in places like Zanzibar in search of raw materials such as cloves, ivory, gold, etc. They would then buy black slaves who they would use to carry the raw materials and also work on their plantations in their various countries abroad. John Henry Clark suggests that the Arabs were no different from other conquerors in world history because they continued to amass an empire which spread from Central Asia and India to Spain, Portugal, and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it is important to note that slavery existed in various forms in several world civilizations, ancient Egypt and their neighbors Greece, Rome, and um, as well as great sub-Saharan African empires and kingdoms. For thousands of years, it existed for thousands of years before the advent of uh, Islam. For example, slaves in Rome were often prisoners of war. Sometimes they were sailors captured and sold by pirates or slaves bought outside Roman territory. When times were hard, it was not uncommon for poor Roman citizens to raise money by selling their children into slavery. Slavery was also used as a punishment for some crimes and offenses. So indentured servitude was a common practice and battles often resulted in the enslavement of war captives. In some African communities, like among the people who evolved into the Yoruba ethnic group, people even sold themselves into slavery. In other words, a poor person might borrow money from a wealthy person and pledge himself as a slave till he had earned and paid the money owed. Crazy as this might sound uh, to us today, pledging oneself like that to raise money was not uncommon. And although these were not necessarily institutionalized uh, practices, People who found themselves indentured in most African society had clear-cut rights which protected them from being manhandled or ill-used by their masters. However, like the transatlantic slave trade, religion and race complicated the way slavery was practiced by Arabs and the way it was spread to other parts of the world under the caliphate. Like Christianity, Islam was developed outside Africa. Similarly, in expanding the, uh, the religion through conquest to solidify the Islamic Caliphate, the religion quickly spread to several parts of the African continent. People who were determined to propagate the Islamic religion then started taking Africans as war captives during the initial spread of the caliphate, just as slaves were taken from other places in Europe, like uh, Turkey, and uh, from among the Slavs of Eastern Europe. Initially, majority of slaves in Arab uh, societies were made to serve predominantly in domestic and military capacities. As Islam progressed, Slavery of non-Muslims then transformed from a minimal feature of the Arab society into a well-organized economic activity. Arab enslavement of Africans then evolved into the oldest race-specific institutionalization of chattel enslavement of Africans. Before Arab Islamic slavery 
in the 7th century. There is no evidence of an institutionalized system of slavery in the form of chattel slavery among sub-Saharan African states. I just want to emphasize that. Islam, like Christianity, facilitated the growth of slavery and the development of the slave trade on a transcontinental scale. While Arabic slave trade launched a phase of Islamization, because most Muslims, uh, most Muslim Arabs, just as Christian Europeans who came later, claimed that it was sanctioned by God. It was actually done for economic reasons because the Arab conquerors only used their religion as an excuse. What they were really after was Africa's resources such as gold, various kinds of uh, wood, ivory, and slaves to initially serve in their military and in domestic capacities. They then started to make them work on plantations and in mining. So there was a progression. Black slaves were taken into the Islamic world from West Africa across the Sahara to Morocco and Tunisia, from Chad across the desert to Libya, from East Africa they were taken down the Nile to Egypt and across the Red Sea and Indian Ocean to Arabia and the Persian Gulf. Slave dealers took the enslaved people acquired from sub-Saharan Africa to towns and markets in major Arab and Persian cities for sale in slave markets and exhibition halls called Marid. Slavery was institutionalized. It, it was so highly institutionalized that in major Arab cities and towns, slave dealers even organized themselves into guilds with their own um, sheikhs, just like um, other craftsmen and professionals. To start out, and in general, slaves were acquired through jihad and also through tribute or by purchase. By the 9th century, capture was the main source of acquiring slaves through caliphal conquests and expansion. A quick word about the jihad. As a physical act during the first uh, centuries of Islam, Jihad was generally practiced as a religious conquest that was inspired by the message of the Prophet Muhammad to propagate Islam to all the corners of the world. Another reason for the enslavement of non-believers was that it was thought that the people captured were some form of compensation for the lives of Muslim soldiers lost during uh, battle or, or uh, mostly jihads. While some scholars believe that uh, the jihad actually refers to personal spiritual battles to bring Muslims closer to God, however, it's used as a holy war for the expansion of Islam soon became the major reason for jihads. This was because one of the tenets of Islam is that Muslims who die in wars for the faith have special rewards in heaven. As such, increasingly, holy battles were carried out on non-believing populations, especially in Africa. Also, the need for slave labor kept growing, and in places like Baghdad in present-day Iraq, slave raiding and slave trading became big business. From major cities in, in the Arab world, it became common practice to wage war against people who were militarily vulnerable. And usually, non-believers of Muslim faith were targeted for enslavement. In theory, 
Individuals who converted to Islam prior to their capture could not lawfully be enslaved. However, many slaves were acquired from Sub-Saharan Africa, whether they practice Islam or not. And in many cases, Africans who adopted the Islamic faith in hope of escaping enslavement were disappointed because many so-called devout Muslims refused to acknowledge African Muslims as true uh, believers. They claimed that the African version of Islam fell short of ac accepted Arab-centric practices. Incidentally, Christians and Jews from Europe who were considered people of the book were usually spared from being enslaved if they agreed to pay taxes that were levied on them by the caliphate. Enslavement of Arabs, whether they were converted to Islam or not, was strictly prohibited. During the Abbasid dynasty, Baghdad was the central city of the empire, but the holy city of Mecca was the center of the Islamic world. As such, Mecca quickly grew into the main market for slave trading, and it remained so up till as recently as 1962, when slavery was officially abolished. Unlike in the Americas, where slaves were used to breed more slaves, procreation among Africans, um, Africans enslaved in the Islamic world was often not permitted. As a matter of fact, marriage between the enslaved was actually prohibited. Which is why, in spite of the millions stolen and transported to the Islamic world, uh, the Middle as well as the Middle East for slavery, their population remained small, and there are very few descendants from enslaved Africans. As a matter of fact, male slaves were castrated so that they could not reproduce. To ensure that they never reproduced, in case they got intimate with their fellow female slaves, the men and boys were castrated and made eunuchs in a brutal, very brutal operation during which majority lost their lives. A large proportion of male slaves were, were thus imported as eunuchs to stop them from having offspring. The, the majority of enslaved African males were emasculated before transporting them to major cities in the Muslim world. And it should be noted that large percentage died as a result of a castration. Most sources say over 50% of them did not survive the procedure. And some who survived the castration chose to commit suicide. Those that survived were used either to guard property or holy sites or for agricultural work on plantations. Sometimes uh, they were used in mining or for military services. They were made to serve the army infantries of Muslim rulers. There was also a high death toll among all classes of slaves, even among those of them who ended up as military commanders. They were like cannon fodder. Slaves died in other large uh, numbers from endemic and uh, epidemic diseases. Male slaves also served in a number of other capacities as uh, grooms, guards, uh, tutors, administrators, musicians, scholars, secretaries, commercial agents, and clerks. Other, uh, another unique use of male slaves was to preserve the honor of their masters 
by guarding the virtue of the master's wives and concubines. As well, because prostitution was prohibited by Islam, most rich and influential people had large harems of women. They therefore also needed eunuchs, castrated men, to guard their women in the harems. Like I said um, earlier, most of the enslaved men were forced to serve as soldiers. This was because the captors believed that castration made them more fearless. So remember the army of eunuchs in the popular Game of Thrones uh, TV series? Well, they were based on real historical eunuchs. Female slaves were normally used as uh, domestics and the prettiest ones were placed in harems. The increase in the number and sizes of harems in the Islam Islamic world was also directly linked to the demand for female slaves. In some instances, depending on the type of slaves demanded by buyers in the Islamic world, during sl uh, slave raids, many of the men were killed if there was not a particular need for men at that time, at the time of the raid. Old men and women were routinely killed, while young women and men were captured because they stood a better chance of surviving the long treks to slave markets in order to be sold. The slave girls and women were assigned such tasks as uh, chambermaids, uh, cooks, uh, seamstresses, and the wet nurses. The most menial and hardest labor or tasks were usually reserved for female African slaves who were considered unattractive. Although the pre-Islamic practice of uh, using female slaves as prostitutes was eventually forbidden by Sharia law, a slave master generally had complete sexual access to his female slaves. And one of the main reasons why Muslim men acquired concubines was for sexual purposes. So we should remain wary of scholars who try to claim that the trans-Saharan slave trade was more benevolent to Africa than the transatlantic slave trade. Both forms of slave trades were reprehensible, irrespective of the claims of the two major religions at one point or another. The main justification put forward for slavery by Islamists is not too different from the motivation that so-called Christians used. Also, Islam did not condemn slavery or the acquisition of people for enslavement as long as it occurred in places that Muslims believed to be outside the house of Islam, the Dar al-Islam. Areas outside of the Dar al-Islam were known, probably still known, as the Dar al Kafir, the land of disbelief. Kafir, as we all know, is still used today to describe non believers. The term Kafir quickly grew to be predominantly used to describe black African people. It was the same term that was used by Europeans in the southern African area to describe black people. I believe that the word gained currency because with the advent of Islamic uh, conquest, which was way before the European conquest of Africa, the Muslim conquerors referred to Africa as the land of Kafir. Again, just like uh, Christian Europe, one of the excuses used by Muslims for their raids on Africa was that Africa was in darkness and Arab Muslims believed themselves to be the sole members of the civilized uh, world who had the duty to enlighten us. Unfortunately, even as Europe 
one of the key players in the African slave trade, abolished the practice hundreds of years ago. And the United States officially ended it in 1865. Arab countries continued the trade, with majority of them only officially ending it in the late 20th century. Today, there are some communities of um, Arabs of African descent in Gulf states, such as Oman, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and uh, the United Arab Air Emirates. There are also communities of Afro-Arabs among Palestinians, Jordanians, Iraqis, Libyans, and in uh, Eastern um, Arabia. So, so what is the condition of the various African communities in the Islamic world today? Please continue watching this series as we try and bring you more about them, starting with the history of the Zanj revolt. Don't miss it. We'll be premiering it soon. It is one of the longest revolts by enslaved Africans trying to gain their freedom in the Islamic world. Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you have not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. Of course, share our videos with all your contacts.